Welcome to Capturing Christianity. I'm Cameron. I'm here with Frank Turek, Dr. Frank Turek. Oh, ooh. I'm well, not the kind of doctor that can help you. Okay. Well, you can You're help gonna, me in one sense, right? You yeah, can help yeah. me with uh, this, learning this, about... Does this look infected to you? Yeah, I'd have that thing cut off immediately. So no, don't, don't ask those <laughs> kind of questions, okay? <laughs> All right, well, let's talk a little about your book, Stealing from God, right? What, right. You want to hold that up? You want to hold this book? Yeah, hold it up this, for the... Capturing the Christianity by this book is brought to you by Stealing from God. Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. How's that? Is that good? That's great. All right, beautiful. That's great. Well, today we're talking about a bunch of different topics. Actually, we're talking about evolution, apologetics, and memes. 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 Yeah, that's going to be real fun. What do you mean? No, that's not your what, podcast. What, it, what do you mean? What do not I mean? What, not what do you mean. Oh. What, okay. what do you mean? What do you mean? Yeah. Yeah, right. we'll get there. Buddy John. We'll get there. So let's open it up with some questions from our patrons, which I'm very thankful for you guys supporting this ministry and making this kind of stuff possible. It's awesome. You guys are awesome. I really appreciate it. You're awesome. Okay, so let's get to the first question. The first question right. is about evolution. Is this an awesome question? It is. It's an okay question. All right, let's see what we can it's do. It's a really it. good question. Has this question evolved? Uh, I don't know. You don't know. All right. Let's see. Is it, <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, is actually, it an intelligently yeah, I, I, designed question or is it just a random question? It is intelligently designed. All right. It's intelligently designed because it has a message. You're refuting evolution right now. I don't there need to go. answer a thing. Go ahead. So Okay. So this is the first question. All right. Okay. And this is from our patrons. So the first one is, is the Bible compatible with evolution? Meaning common ancestry is true, but the process was guided. Well, it depends on what you mean by that. If you mean biblical inerrancy, it doesn't appear to be compatible because you've got God creating Adam out of the dust, not out of pre-existing animal forms. So I would say no. But even if macroevolution were true, and I don't think it is, but even if it were true, that wouldn't mean Christianity was false. It would give us problems for biblical inerrancy in the Old Testament, but it wouldn't mean Christianity was false. God could still exist and Christian, Christianity could still be true because Jesus came and died and rose from the dead. So it's a secondary issue in my view, evolution. It's an interesting issue, but it's a secondary issue. It's not an essential of the faith one way or the okay. other. Okay. So why do you say that we'd have to reject? Is that what you're saying? We'd have to reject biblical inerrancy in well, order to Well, yeah, adopt? if we're going to say, or unless we're just going to allegorize the whole thing and, and say okay. when when Genesis says that God created Adam out of the dust, that uh -huh. was just a metaphor of some kind for... Mm -hmm. Uh, God created. Well, so what if someone said that that's the correct interpretation? So, right, there's different interpretations of Scripture. Mm -hmm. So maybe they just say that the correct interpretation sort of leaves it an open question of how God brought about life. So well, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't reject inerrancy or even inspiration. It would just be this is a different interpretation of this biblical passage. Right. I think you can do that with some passages. That one seems pretty, pretty clear to me. Though, Which one? That God creates Adam out of the dust. He doesn't create him out of pre-existing life forms. Mm -hmm. uh, he He seems to directly, divinely create Adam out of the dust. So mm -hmm. uh, all the other animals are created and then you get man. So yeah. well, some, it would some seem people, to be an odd interpretation to, to say that we could fit evolution in there. Yeah. Some theologians think that you could have like a separate event of God creating man specifically, but then everyone else or all the other life forms sort of going through the evolutionary process. And so God sort of specially creates man somewhere down the line. And yeah, I hadn't heard that before. I'd have to see what kind of argumentation they give for that. Yeah. But it seems to be he's creating the life forms individually through the days, and mm -hmm. then you get to man in day six, and he creates them. But let me just say this, that even if macroevolution were 100% true, the laws that drive it still need a mind behind them. Because, no, that I agree with. Yeah, because the world is not random. The world has order to it and structure. That's how we can yeah. do science, by yeah. the way, as cause and effect, reliable cause and effect, very fine-tuned natural laws. So even if you were to say that somehow these life forms could come into existence through some sort of natural process, the natural process itself is guided by a mind because the natural forces that when we combine, we call them natural laws, require a mind. They're consistent, they're precise, they're very fine-tuned. They require a mind to even exist. So you don't get away from uh, some kind of intelligence yeah. by saying macroevolution is true. Definitely agree there. All right, let's move on to our next question, mm -hmm. which is, is your opposition to theistic evolution primarily philosophical, biblical, or scientific in nature? Yes. No, it's more, it's more, the, it's more um, scientific because scientific, okay. not only do I see... Um, well, yeah, explain to me what you mean by scientific. Like, how, uh, how Well, when people issue? are trying to say that um, 
we could have evolved through natural selection. Mm -hmm. First of all, most, I can't say most, but there's a movement among even atheistic Darwinists, as you know, to find a new theory of macroevolution because neo-Darwinism doesn't work. There was the famous meeting back in 2016, November 2016, in the Royal Society over there in the UK, where they called a meeting. They basically said the current theory of macroevolution doesn't work. We need to find a new one. Now, you're, they gonna, didn't. you're gonna have to inform me on this because I don't know about this, this, oh. this meeting that took place. Oh, okay. Um, well, actually a couple of folks from the Discovery Institute went, uh, Stephen Meyer, Doug Axe, maybe a couple others. Mm -hmm. And uh, this meeting was advertising the fact that the theory of neo-Darwinian evolution does not work. You can't so modify. Then, so, then, so for anyone who may not know what yeah. neo-Darwinian evolution is, that's like what the two mechanisms, right? Natural selection and random mutation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then or natural selection acting on random mutations. Sure. You right? can't that's how take you a genetic code and modify it and get new body plants. You can modify it randomly mm -hmm. or even maybe even intelligently from now till doomsday, you'll never get a new body plant. Why? Why? Because DNA itself does not give you a new body plant. DNA codes for proteins, but to get a new body plan, you need another kind of information known as epigenetic information. Epigenetic information is the structure. To use an analogy, where here we are sitting in a beautiful chapel. Um, the software that designed this chapel will never give you the chapel. The software will give you the instructions on how to build the chapel, but in order to have the chapel, you need physical materials. You need concrete, you need nails, you need wood, you need, you know, all those things. You need a foundation. Hmm. That, when it comes to biology, the analogy there with biology is in epigenetic information, the structure of the cell is, is sort of like the structure of this chapel. Whereas the software, the DNA would be, the analogous part there would be the, 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 the uh, software program that came up with the blueprint for this particular okay. chapel. So, Modifying the software will not get you a chapel. Modifying DNA will not get you a new body plan. Okay, and, I'm, maybe, I'm, maybe I have a disconnect here. Break mm -hmm. that down for me. Like how, how are we not getting a new body plan if you have the information there? Because information alone doesn't give you the new body plan. You need the structure itself. So you don't need- So what structure do you mean? What well, like the cell wall, right? So that has to be, so okay, so you have the, but through like when a new- mm -hmm life form mm -hmm. comes from the previous, whatever, generation. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that the, like, if we even had new DNA, like a new DNA mm -hmm. code, mm -hmm. you won't get the new structure. You, no, you need the structure as well. Okay. And then I, so why look, wouldn't the structure be there? I'm standing on the shoulders of people like Stephen Meyer. He's the real expert in this, okay? okay? There, there are several other problems with macroevolution other than epigenetic information. Okay. One is genetic limits to change. Like we can use our minds to breed all kinds of dogs, right? But we mm -hmm. run into genetic limits. We can't go smaller than say a Chihuahua or larger than a Great Dane. Mm -hmm. Here we are using our minds to try and expand the genus of dogs, but we can't break certain genetic barriers. Mm -hmm. If using our minds, we can't break certain genetic bar barriers, why do we think an unintelligent process could do it? Well, maybe, well, I, I think the answer that they would give is that it's just a long process, right? Over the, over the, you might a year, over a million years, maybe we could make dogs smaller or larger. Well, the problem with that is, is Richard Lenski has done work on that with E. coli bacteria, where he's taken the same E. coli bacteria and tried to modify it over, I think, 30 or 40 years, probably 30 something years by now. Mm -hmm. And after all that time, which, be, would, would, which would be equivalent to about a million years of human evolution, he still has just E. coli bacteria. So maybe that just applies to E. coli and not to... Well, I mean, you could... You could come up with any possibility you want, mm -hmm. right? But when you come up with possibilities, possibilities are not evidence. You can say, well, maybe that, maybe that, yeah, maybe it is that, yeah. but that's not evidence. That's just a possibility. Uh, so, well, maybe the possibility is equally as likely as the explanation that it can't happen. Say that again. So maybe the pos, because it's it's a possible explanation of what's going on. Evolution is an explanation. So you could have a possible explanation of. Yeah, the E. coli can't evolve, or we can't get it past this whatever. Using our intelligence, we can't. Use, yeah, we can't use yeah, our intelligence yeah, yeah. to get past it. Yeah. But other things can happen given enough time. So that's a possible explanation, but it equally explains the data. No, it doesn't explain the data because there's no evidence for it. It's just a possibility. There's a difference between coming up with a possibility and coming up with evidence for a possibility. And if all the evidence at this point says we can't break this genetic barrier, why would we suggest that we can break a genetic barrier? It's kind of the natural law of the gaps argument here. We haven't found a natural law yet to do this, mm -hmm. but if we wait long enough, we're gonna find a natural law that does this. Well, that's called faith. 
okay? <laughs> if give me enough time. In fact, I had this at the University of Michigan years ago. There was an atheist who got up to the microphone and I just given evidence for the cosmological argument, the evidence that a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, personal, intelligent being created the universe. And, and he said, oh no, one day we're gonna find a natural cause mm -hmm. for the universe. I said, John, his name was John. I said, John, I'm never gonna find a natural cause for all of nature. If nature had a beginning, it can't be a natural cause. And he said, no, no, given, given enough time, we'll find it. I said, no, in principle, you can't find it. And I said, first of all, can't, John, can't find it, you right. can't find a natural yeah. cause for all of nature. Uh, and I said, first of all, it sounds like a lot like faith. Right? Give me enough time, I'm gonna figure this out. That's a faith position. But secondly, it's- Well, maybe it's a faith position that's, that's based on good reasons. Like what? Uh, they, they, I, mean, I guess they would have to be the, the evidence from common ancestry. It could be something no, like that. No, I'm talking that. about the beginning of the universe now. Oh, oh, oh the beginning oh, oh, of the universe. Oh, okay. oh sorry. If I, the I'm universe had a beginning, right. then it can't be something inside the universe that brought it into existence because right. it didn't exist yet. It's got to be something outside the universe. So I said to him, I said, John, to say, when you say, just give me enough time and I'll figure out a natural cause for all of nature, that would be like me saying, if you give me enough time, I'll discover that I gave birth to my own mother. No, you can't. I can't give birth to my own mother no matter how much time I spend because my mother must exist prior to me. The same thing is true if the universe, all of nature, had a beginning and didn't exist at one point, then there has to be something that transcends all of nature, something super nature, supernatural. And if space, matter, and time had a beginning, it seems to me the only cause that could have brought it into existence is a spaceless, timeless, immaterial cause. See, that I like because it's deductive and you can mm -hmm. show that like, if you bring something physical into existence, then you can't have something physical that brings all physical reality into existence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't see how that applies to the evolutionary case. Well, let's go back to the evolutionary case okay. for just a minute. Okay. First of all, evolutionists could stop intelligent design people in their tracks if they could answer one question. And the question is, what natural laws or natural forces can produce information? They can't answer that question, why? Because there is no answer. No natural force can produce information. If you're walking along the beach and you see in the sand, John loves Mary, you don't assume the waves did that or crabs came out of the water and made that message. You assume there had to be a mind that did that. Why? Because in all your prior experience, you know that messages always come from minds. Now, this is not a God of the gaps argument. Why? Because we're, we're not arguing from what we don't know. We're arguing from what we do know. We don't have a gap in our knowledge when we say John, we see John loves Mary in the sand. Mm -hmm. We go, that's positive, empirically verifiable evidence for an intelligent cause. So we're arguing. Yeah, what so we I do think know. what they what they'd have to do is just say that it was it was random, right? That there was no sort of explanation. It was just it just happened. That's not an explanation. Yeah. That that's that's just faith. It's to remove an explanation. Yeah, that's faith. And and when people say, well, you don't have an explanation for it, as Ed Fazer would say, yeah, you've had him on your program. I just gave an explanation. Now you may not like it, but it's an explanation. Mm -hmm. So evolutionists have the problem of, at the very basis of life, there's information. Even a one-celled amoeba, as Richard Dawkins would admit, has a thousand volumes worth of an encyclopedia in it. Now most of your viewers don't know what an encyclopedia is. People used to come to your house with big books and say, would you buy these for me? Well, you know? well they, they're familiar with Wikipedia, the okay. incredibly reliable Wikipedia. Yes, yes. They used to come in books, like 26 of them, about this thick and about this big. Encyclopedias, check it out. Okay, well, let's move on to the next question. We've just we've talked about evolution. Now by the way, by the way, no, let me just say one other thing about evolution. We didn't get through all this, and I just want to I just want to complete the circle. Okay, Not only genetic it. limits to change, irreducible complexity, fossil record. Uh, these are things. The fossil record is interesting. The fossil record yeah. is interesting yeah. because when I was looking into evolution a long time ago, uh -huh. and I'm completely agnostic about the intelligent design thing, about evolution, biological complexity, uh -huh. and everything. I'm still. Um, my mind is completely open to it. So, but when I was looking into it, I did notice. It's in here. Put anyway. that down. Put that oh, down. Sorry. Okay. Go uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did notice uh -huh. that there there are big gaps in the fossil record, mm -hmm. and so there there are naturalistic explanations for for why those gaps occur. It's because fossilization is something that's very rare, doesn't happen all the time, and so we would expect to see these sorts of gaps. And a lot of Christians, I think, use the same kind of argument when we're talking about the the uh, the problem of evil is that we don't have all the information, and so there's we do expect to have some gaps in our knowledge of God's reasons for allowing this and that in the world. So I think that there's a, maybe a parallel there to what the Christian is doing with the problem of evil and what the naturalists would do with. Well, the, no, because in the problem of evil, we do have some reasons for knowing why evil exists. Yeah, for well, example, they, they would say that, well, they would say we know some reasons why some animals were show up in our fossil records. 
Yeah, because they fossilize. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but but we'd ex expect gaps because of but they, not, they don't happen all the but time. But not all the phyla coming into existence, or twenty of the twenty-eight phyla coming into existence instantaneously. Yeah, we that's wouldn't different. Expect that. That's Cambrian explosion. Cambrian explosion. Yeah. Cambrian explosion. Yeah. So no, if if and this is what troubled Darwin. This was called Darwin's doubt. This is why he said, if my theory is true, why isn't the fossil record just littered with transitional forms everywhere? Why do we see the Cambrian explosion just pop up in individually? All these mm -hmm. phyla, just no fossil precursors. So, well, I think it's definitely an interesting question yeah. about oh, sure. the fossil record. And it's not a sure. question essential to the faith. It's just interesting to talk about. Yeah, that. right. Let's move on to questions on apologetics, okay? Right. And this one is another one from our patrons. What is the number one roadblock among college students that keeps, from the, that keeps them from accepting the gospel? Sex. Next. Next, next question. Because <laughs> they <laughs> Do don't want, want it to be true. Okay. Look, I mean, you're, the people out there who are watching, I ask people on college campuses all the time, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? An atheist will stand at the microphone and say no. And when I talk to them privately, they'll admit. They don't want to live up to sexual, the sexual Christian ethic or the Christian sexual ethic. The elephant in the room in the college campus is not, the same thing is true on YouTube, elephant in the room is not evidence, it's sex. People want to live the way they want to live, and they don't want anyone telling them or anyone else how they have to behave sexually, despite the fact that they still believe in certain sexual rules. Right, you don't have sex with children. You know, it has to be consent. You know, so, so they, so they how do you, still impose rules on it. But so, how do you address that? How do you go? Like, for instance, when you're having a conversation with one of these college students and they reveal this to you, it's because I want to have sex with anyone I want to have sex with. Mm -hmm. what, how do you respond to that? And thanks that for being situation? honest. At least we, you know, where you stand. Okay. And then you just sort of well allow the Holy Spirit to yeah I mean you you can say I always ask him if it were true would you become a Christian when they say no what else can you do you can yeah. just say well God gives you the free will to do what you want to do make the choices you want to make that's why this is a moral universe because we have free will and we can make these choices so how so, often does that happen that they say that they if it was true they wouldn't believe it oh most happens of the all the time really yeah I mean there are that, some there are some that'll say stuff like this Cameron they'll say see I'm just really incredulous about that like it, it seems weird that people would admit that and well, maybe, maybe it's because we live in a sort of postmodern culture yeah. that doesn't care about truth or they'll say they'll say it this way if you ask them if christianity were true would you become a christian they'll say yeah but you couldn't prove it oh yeah you know that kind of thing which mm -hmm. really means no yeah. i mean let's be honest yeah you can't prove okay. with 100 percent certainty yeah yeah yeah, yeah, can, yeah yeah okay you can't prove atheism with 100% certainty either, but you, you're telling me to be an atheist, so what, what's your... Well, hey, wait a second, because right? atheism is just a lack of belief. Oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> stop. I'm going to slap you. <laughs> well, you can pour, so silly. Yeah, the, the lack of belief stuff I don't mm -hmm. take very yeah, seriously. Yeah. Well, actually, it's just, it's just the person's psychological state. So I lack a belief in materialism. Does that make materialism false necessarily? No. My psychological state doesn't tell me whether or not Christianity is true or false or atheism is true or false. Yeah, see, to me, it just it screams of... I want to avoid any semblance of burden of proof. That's right. And that's that's my answer to that. Is just let the other person do all the mm -hmm. arguing, which everyone knows is a lot more difficult to do to defend your position than to just, you know, yeah, like I, just express skepticism right. about it. You can do that about anything. Sure. And, and that's what the Christians point out a lot is that like if you really want to be a skeptic, mm -hmm. then embrace solipsism. Embrace oh. the idea that you're the only mind out there. Why aren't you skeptical of skepticism? Well, there you go. Actually, it, the easiest way of dealing with it, just ask a person who says that they lack a belief, is just three questions, or, or just say this. Um, here are three positions. God exists, God doesn't exist, or I don't know. Which one are you closer to? Now, if they say, I don't know, you're an agnostic. If they say no, they're an atheist. If they say yes, they're a theist. Okay, done. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just... It's also like just a semantic thing. Sure. That's what I like to do too, yeah. is just be like, okay, do you embrace this or not? Yeah, and if you yeah. don't, then that's fine. What do you think is more likely? Yeah. God does exist, doesn't exist, yeah. you don't know. You yeah. What, yeah. I've, what I've actually suggested on a video that I recorded a little while ago was there's, there's two questions you can ask an atheist. One of them is, do you believe that God exists? And mm -hmm. if they answer yes or no, well, if they're an atheist, they'll answer no. And then you can say, well, do you also believe in evidentialism, which is the idea that 
your beliefs ought to be proportioned to the evidence. Mm -hmm. And so if they answer no, they believe God does not exist, and they also believe that your beliefs ought to be proportioned to the evidence, ask them, well, what's your evidence that God doesn't exist? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. usually, I think the same, same kind of situation happens with a lot of Christians too, is that we're not really prepared to defend the things that we believe. No. And with an atheist, the same thing is going to happen. So if you ask that to an atheist, you're probably mm -hmm. going to get the same kind of like blank stare. Or, and you see, that presupposes that this is a universe that is reasonable and has, and has evidence. This is what I'm trying to do in the book, Stealing from God, is pointing out that when atheists say they have reasons, that there is no God or that atheism is true or materialism is true or quantum vacuums or whatever they want to say, they're actually stealing an orderly universe from God in order to say that God doesn't exist. They're stealing our ability to reason. Why should we, why should we be able to reason about things outside of our skulls if there's no God, if we're just molecular machines, if we're just moist robots? We shouldn't. But that's what they say we are. We're moist robots. So why should we believe anything they say? You've, got some, you've got some one-liners that are just doozies. Well, moist robots. That's I, what they are. I don't know anyone that's else what, who uses that's that. That's what they're claiming we are. We're moist robots. So why moist should we believe robots. anything we think? Well, let's move on to the next, the, the okay. next question here. If, if you had two minutes with Richard Dawkins or one of the other new atheists, what would you say? What so you, maybe you could like put, like, imagine you're in an elevator okay. ride. Okay. And, 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 Pretend and, I'm Dawkins. And it's, and it's appropriate to have the conversation. Yeah. Hey, Richard, I've read a lot of your, your books. Well, that's very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's very nice. Uh, let me ask you a question. You, you claim to be a materialist. So when you say you're materialist, you think everything is driven by the laws of physics, correct? Yes. So why should you believe anything you think? So you do a you do a kind of like ask a question, questions, yeah. So you do a question thing, yeah. yeah. Ask him questions and see. Because I want the I want the answer to that, Cameron. Yeah. I've asked Michael Shermer to that twice in debate. He hasn't answered. Is that is, so? He he really didn't give an answer. No. He just what did he do? Debate, did he just was, deflect or move on? Stony Brook. Yeah, he kind of made a joke out of it. I said, if you're a moist robot, if you're just a molecular machine, why should you believe anything you think? He said, oh, electric me. That's all he said. Electric me. Electric me. Like I don't know what that means. It means he's just bunch of uh, electrical impulses going on. He's, yeah. He wouldn't answer the question. Mm -hmm. There is well, no answer to it. From well, here's one thing that I like to say, and it's a, I made a video on this. I even have t-shirts. Questions are not arguments. That's right. So they're, 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 they can maybe raise some interesting questions. Just like possibilities about, are not arguments. We talked about that earlier. Yeah, that I'm still a little iffy on. I think possibilities can be ex possible explanations. And if it's a good explanation. If there's evidence yeah, behind it. Because everything is a possibility up front or at first, and right. then you find evidence for it. And right, but if there's no evidence for it, it's just a possibility. It's yeah. not a, it's not. Yeah, a, right. It's not. It's just not a good explanation. Yeah, it's a possi possible explanation, but it's not mm -hmm, a, mm -hmm. a good one mm -hmm. that necessarily fits the evidence. So what, what would you say then to like, the, the point about questions are not arguments is that like, if you were to give an argument maybe in a, a, a quick elevator ride, what would you, what would you do? To there? Richard Dawkins? Yeah. Yeah, instead of well, instead of going the question route, if you had to, if you were going to go the, the argument route, what would you do? Well, I think because it may okay. So so pretend that Richard go. Well, why do you believe that God exists? You know, prove to me that God exists. Okay, well, I would start with the cosmological argument. Space, and you can do this in a, you can do this in a minute because yeah, I'm really space, curious. Space matter and time had a beginning, as you and all your colleagues agree with. Then whatever caused the universe can't be made of space matter and time. It must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful to create the universe out of nothing, personal in order to choose to create, also intelligent in order to be able to make a choice. Now, does that prove the Christian God? No. Well, may, maybe but it I'm may not, be the Christian God. It certainly seems to disprove atheism. So maybe I'm not super familiar with Richard Dawkins' beliefs. Does he believe that the universe began to exist or is he more on the eternal side of things? Which I'm learning is actually like a perennial question that's been going on in philosophy for thousands of years. Yeah, well, I really think cool. that he would suggest, what he would suggest is, Which he side is he on? in his book, The God Delusion is, yeah, it looks like the universe had a beginning, but I think as he puts it, uh, let's just wait for physics Darwin. It's a faith position. Mm -hmm. You know, well, Darwin has already explained biology to us, even though Dawkins admits that the origin of life is a complete mystery to everybody, according to him. Um, Darwin has explained biology, so physics is waiting for, for, um, for its Darwin, so to speak. So we're, we're just going to be agnostic at this point. Okay. When I think it's quite obvious that space, matter, and time had a beginning. We know time had a beginning philosophically. Otherwise, today never would have gotten here. It That's can't be an infinite number of days before today. So if time had a beginning, whatever created time must be timeless. And isn't it interesting that 
Dawkins had no problem years ago, or let me just say it this way, atheists had no problem years ago, I don't know if it was Dawkins or not, because Dawkins lives in the modern era, but atheists had no problem years ago believing that the universe was eternal and had no cause, right? Just it's eternal. But now they have a problem believing that God's eternal. God must have a cause. No, you never thought the universe had a cause when it was eternal. Now suddenly God needs a cause? If he's outside of time, he's timeless. He doesn't need a cause. He didn't, he didn't have a beginning. He's uncaused. That's the whole point. There so, has to be an uncaused okay, first cause. So I like, a, I like to clarify there because the contingency argument is compatible with an eternal universe. And so it's not, it's not that eternal existence is the thing that differentiates between when something needs a cause and when something doesn't need a cause. I think it's more along the lines of perfection versus imperfection. So that, I like to make a clarification there. So it wouldn't be eternal existence that would be the difference there. Because even in eternal, like the, the example that, I think Leibniz gave this example of a geometry book mm -hmm. that where you've been borrowing geometry books or lending geometry books for past infinite well, time. Well, you can't. You'd never get to today's ge geometry Well, books. Well, let's just suppose for the sake of argument that you could, he would say that there's still got to be some explanation why there, it's a geometry book mm -hmm. lending situation. Sure, that's a quite As opposed to like mathematics book or a literature book or some, some other kind of book. So that what that shows is that an eternal regress or an infinite regress is not enough to explain existence. No, of course not. And Aquinas' fifth argument is great when he talks about the fact that there's got to be, since there's direction in the world, there's got to be a director. In other words, it doesn't just need to be a cause way back when. There needs to be a cause every moment the universe exists because the universe is directed. Things in the universe are directed. I think, I don't know if it was Aristotle who brought this up originally. He probably didn't use this example, but the example of an acorn. Why does an acorn always become an oak tree? Why doesn't it become an elm tree? or a birch tree, or a seahorse, because it's programmed to become an oak tree. Now does it- oak... Also natural laws. Yeah, well the natural laws- You gotta take laws, those into account too. But that's right? what I'm saying. The natural laws yeah. drive yeah. the oak tree in a direction, or the acorn in a direction. Well, an acorn doesn't have a mind, yet it reliably goes in a direction. Why does it reliably go in a direction? Because there must be an external mind directing it toward an end. Every single second that it exists, that is what we mean by God. That's why Aquinas, said, this is my fifth way to argue for God. He's, he's borrowing from Aristotle, who came up, well, there must be an, with an unmoved mover. Aristotle thought the universe was eternal. Mm -hmm. When Aristotle's talking about the unmoved mover, he's not talking about the cosmological argument. Yep. He's talking about the argument from present day, um, how do I put this? If you were to split- the, A vertical say, cause yeah. rather than a horizontal cause, that yeah. every second the universe is directed by a cause underneath it. That, was, that came up in the, the phaser debate too. Oh yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. that's that's a big phaser in his book, The Last Superstition, explains that well. Yeah. With and that's I quote phaser in the Stealing from God book. Let's move on to another question. This one is: If someone wanted to be a professional apologist themselves, what steps would you recommend to them? I'm sorry, I can't say. No, uh, <laughs> I would say that you you should uh, pursue an education. You certainly say, pursue probably. an education. Um, I mean, you can do this without getting formal education. You're doing it without getting formal education. You can be good at it, but you do get another level of precision by going through a formal program. And the reason for that is you don't know what you don't know. Exactly. Right? There are things that I never would have known even existed unless I went through a formal program and I wouldn't have read them because yeah. I wouldn't have known they existed. So there are certain things you get out of a formal program. The second thing I think you need. Well, it makes you read things that you wouldn't read on your exactly. own. Exactly. Yeah, and, and it, like for me, forces I, you to read I read stuff that I want to read. Yeah. And that's one of the downfalls of being an autodidact. Right, right. But I mean, you, you do it both. I mean, you got to be self-taught yeah. to a certain extent, but you also should get a formal education if you can. And today's day and age, you can do it online. Yeah. You know, It's not as good as being there in person, but you can do it. And it gives you structure that you wouldn't get otherwise. The other thing, although this is changing due to the social media environment, if you want to have credibility, you can do it in two ways. You can get write a book, which is gives you instant credibility. Even if it's a bad book, people will say, well, this guy's an expert, He's right? An He's got a book, <laughs> All right? And the second way you can do it in this new day and age is through YouTube, which is what you're doing. Yeah. Right? You can get credibility that way. So yeah. those are the two ways you can do it now. It used to be just you had to have a book. It helps to have a book, though. Yeah. So you can just go to a church, for instance, and speak if you have a book. And they'll, Sure, they'll yeah, they're going to say, this guy's a book, must be somebody. Yeah. Right, even though he could be a complete doofus. <laughs> so, because now you can self-publish your own book. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, here's another one. What other apologetics podcasts or YouTube channels do you listen to or watch? 
uh, always. Well, obviously, you watch Capturing Christianity. Yeah, I've watched Capturing Christianity. I just saw the Phaser um, Oppie. Oppie debate. Yep. yep, which was great. And I've seen some of your other videos, obviously. Um, the ones, the podcast, I normally listen to podcasts more than YouTube because I'm driving, you know. Yeah. Uh, or Do you have a commute or, or? No, but if I'm driving to the airport or I'm driving to some event, you know, I'll put a podcast on. So, so I what always, are some of your favorites? Always listen to William Lane Craig, Reasonable Faith. Got right? to. I always listen to Stand to Reason. Uh, Greg Kokel, who's here with us as we're, we're here in New York, teaching yep. the CIA. Um, I, in terms of apologetics podcasts, I often listen to Unbelievable, Justin Briley's debate show. Yeah, that's great. Which is yep. very good. Uh, let's see, what else? How many times have you been on that, by the way? Just twice. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, once I was there in London, and the other time it was uh, with Alex. Home. Yeah, Alex O'Connor. Alex O'Connor. Yeah, nice young man, smart yeah. young man. I, I debated him too on the the argument from contingency. Oh, you did. That was oh, fun. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. He's very smart. Very young. Mm -hmm. uh, but he he didn't quite understand that his view is self defeating. I mean, if he's going to be a materialist, why should he believe anything he thinks? Right. If he's going to say all of our thoughts came to us, all our, he put it this way that our moral thoughts came to us from evolution. Well, that means all of our thoughts came to us from evolution. So why should we believe any of our thoughts? So that's like the evolutionary argument against naturalism. Sure. Type yeah. Deal. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's the, it's the idea that if you're going to say that you have a reason to believe something, you ought to be able to follow the evidence where it leads. But if, if our thoughts are coming from some sort of blind, random process, physical or biological, and there's no me here to react to the evidence and follow the evidence where it leads, I'm just simply like a Coke can fizzing. You know, I'm just a moist robot. Why should I believe anything? There you go. So I think that was... His, what was so? What think, was it? The, the can fizzing and moist robots. A coke can fizzing. That's coke actually Doug Wilson said that in one of his debates with Christopher Hitchens. Not moist robot, but coke can fizzing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's another analogy that Craig gives, like a tree growing a branch. Uh -huh. That's like the, that's yeah. a, the same amount of rationality. Yeah. I don't want to. Oh, Jay Wallace on that. is another one. It's a good. What is he podcast? Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Sorry, we got. There are others too. I'm I'm just drawing a blank right now. Uh, but right. there. There's others I listen to. There's occasion. tons. There's tons. I, I listen to sometimes Michael Heiser's Naked Bible Podcast. Oh, that one's great. Yeah. And then... Um, the one on the head coverings, have you listened to that one? I haven't listened. Oh, well, yeah, maybe I did. Maybe I did. As a matter of fact, a couple about a year ago, though. It's been a while. That one was... It blew my mind. Yeah. Um, and uh, what other podcasts do I listen to? Sometimes I listen to Andy Stanley. Uh, sometimes I listen to... Um, oh, I, always, I love Tim Keller. Oh yeah, Tim, Tim Keller. Tim Keller is probably my favorite favorite preacher because he so he so he's so well read. Gracefully integrates philosophy and apologetics into preaching. Mm -hmm. Right. I think honestly, I think that's how we're going to reach culture. Yeah. is through preaching. Yes. Yes. And so we have to have preachers mm -hmm. who are popular. Yeah, he's and, very very good. And he's here in New York. He's in New York. Forgot about it. All right. Unbelievable. <laughs> All right. Another question on apologetics, and then we'll move to memes. Mm -hmm. uh, R.C. Sproul's good too, by the way. R.C. Sproul uh -huh. podcast? Yep. Oh, I didn't know he had a podcast. It's called Renewing Your Mind. That's good. Okay, so this one comes from Russ. He says, a common response given by Frank to suppose atrocities in the Old Testament is that on Christianity, people just change location. Does this description trivialize death as the due penalty for sin? Trivialize death as the due penalty for sin. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it trivializes, trivial, trivializes it. I think what he's referring to there is that if God exists and Christianity is true, that when people die, they don't go out of existence. That's what I'm saying. They yeah. just change location. They go from this life to the next life. And my point is, is that God can do that anytime he wants. He can move us from this life to next life anytime he wants. He can move us at two years old or 82 years old or any other time he wants to move us. So when people say, well, killing children as it appears, God kills children in the Old Testament. Well, he's evil for doing that. Well, God is the author of life. He can take life anytime he wants and move us into the next life anytime he wants. Uh, and to say that only God is fair if everyone gets to live to 80 years old, that, that doesn't strike me as the right argument to make, that God's the author of life. He can move us from this life to the next life anytime he wants. Yeah, I think there's actually something to that because Richard Swinburne argues something similar. I forget mm -hmm. what book it's in. But he argues basically the same kind of thing, that if mm -hmm. you own something, if you're the owner mm -hmm. of it, then you have right over it in some sense. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't treat us in an arbitrary way. like a, uh, He doesn't treat us like we're just property because mm -hmm. we're made in his image. But since 
when once life begins, it's eternal. The transition point to the next life is up to God, not up to us. Let's move on to memes now. So the first question I have, and this one was not from our patrons, I wanted to actually just ask you, mm -hmm. what is your take on memes? Do you like memes? Do you laugh at memes? Oh, well, sure. You, yeah, sometimes do, I do, but obviously- do you, do you like endorse memes and apologetics? I haven't been asked that yet. Mm. I don't know. It depends on like, what do you it think, is. So some apologists, the, the, the younger apologists mm -hmm. right now are using memes to sort of reach culture. Yeah. So do you endorse that type of thing? Even though that memes are sort of like, supposed to be surface level. Yeah, it, 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 if it's a meme followed by a YouTube video that, that unpacks the issue more, sure. Yeah. Yeah, why not? It get, yeah. gets people thinking. It's just a way to get people thinking a little bit about a slogan because most people live their lives by slogans. They develop a, well, they don't live their lives by slogans. Let me say that another way. People create a worldview based on slogans, never knowing if the slogans A are true or B really what they even mean. They just like them. And mm. sometimes these slogans are mutually contradictory, but they try and hold them together in one worldview. So if you can take a slogan or a meme and then discuss the slogan or meme and maybe expose it as being false, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. And that's what John McRae does. Sure. Uh, yeah. What do you mean? Yeah, exactly. So here's a, here's a question, and this is sort of related to memes. How would you respond to the meme that says, God didn't really sacrifice anything having Jesus die on the cross. He knew Jesus would be back in heaven in three days. And so he didn't really give up anything. He just gave up his weekend. Yeah, I would say to that person. Um, or to the meme, because it's a meme. Oh, to yeah, the it's, meme. It's a, it's a meme oh, that, that oh, goes around. Yeah, oh. a lot of people say that God only, you know, had okay. to give up Jesus for a weekend. Like, so he, or Jesus oh. gave up his life for a weekend. He gave up a weekend for your sins. Okay, but if I were to strap that person, the person who made that meme, if I were to strap him to a cross and torture him for three days or a day, um, and die the kind of death that Jesus did, would it just be like being gone for a weekend? Is that it? No, I mean, there's obviously so much more to what happened to Jesus than just being gone for a weekend. Yeah. He literally took our punishment on himself. He still had to go through that, even though he, wouldn't, he knew he was going to be resurrected. It still hurt. <laughs> it still was an awful experience to go through, even though he knew he'd be resurrected. Yeah. So it's, it's not like, well, nothing really happened. He just went to sleep and woke up three days later. No, he went through a torturous procedure, a torturous treatment, and took our punishment on himself. So I don't understand that meme at all. It was still difficult. Yeah. It was still Yeah, calling it murderous. a weekend is just a rhetorical yeah, thing. Yeah, that's right. So if, I, if we were to strap him to a cross and say, hey, don't worry, we're going to resurrect you, but you're going to have to go through this. It's really no big deal. It's he just a weekend. Yeah, he would object, right? He'd say, no. <laughs> no, uh, I want that weekend to, right. to not be filled with crucifixion mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. suffocation. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, this next one, and this isn't technically a meme, but a lot of people say that Jesus was a failed apocalyptic prophet. Mm. People were saying that this generation would not pass away before he came back and he never did. So how would you respond to that? Yeah, to that's that a meme? misunderstanding of that particular passage. Um, when he quotes in Matthew 24, when he says the stars will fall from the sky or, the, or the, the moon and the sun will not give its light, he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 13, verse 10. And Isaiah chapter 13, verse 10 is a reference to the destruction of Babylon back in like 690 BC. It's an apocalyptic way of saying judgment is coming. So the stars didn't literally fall from the sky in 690 BC or 689, whenever it was. And the stars didn't fall from the sky in 70 AD either. Not literally, it's an apocalyptic way of saying it. And we use this kind of phrase, phraseology all the time. You know, it was a landslide. Yeah. You know, it was an earthquake. And that's what Jesus is saying there when he's quoting from Isaiah, he's quoting apocalyptic literature to say judgment will come. And when he says all these things will happen before this generation passes away, he said that in 30 AD. When did it happen? It happened in 70 AD. The entire nation was overrun by the Romans and their blessed temple was destroyed and it hasn't been rebuilt to this day. So 
it was judgment. It was destruction. It was like an earthquake, a landslide, slide, or like the sun and moon not giving their light. But it wasn't meant to be taken literally. It's, 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 a, it's a, just a hyperbolic way of explaining it's going to be a terrible time. Judgment is coming. So it's not a false prop prophecy at all. In fact, I think it shows that the New Testament writers are telling the truth. And all the documents were written prior to 70 AD. Why? Because nowhere does anybody later say, look, Jesus was right. Why? Because it hadn't happened yet. The New Testament documents are written. Most of them are written, maybe all of them, are written prior to 70 AD. Well, that's actually a thing that some scholars use to date Mark's gospel mm -hmm. after 70 AD because it predicts the destruction of the temple. Yeah, well, that's just uh, what they're doing there is they're begging the question. They have an anti-supernatural bias, and they say that that can't, he couldn't have predicted that. The problem is, is we know that Luke certainly is prior to 70 AD. Why? Because Paul, when he writes 1 Corinthians, is quoting Luke. And he's writing 1 Corinthians. Everybody agrees, even Bart Ehrman agrees, he's writing it in 55 or 56 AD. How can he quote a document that didn't exist? He's quoting Luke. And who does Wait, which, which passage is this? Uh, where does he... Where does he quote Luke in 1 Corinthians? He quotes Luke. I'd have to go back and look at the passage. But he's quoting Luke's um, description of the, of the Last Supper. I think it's in 1 Corinthians... I'd have to go back and look exactly what, I want to say it's 14, but I have to go back and look at it. Okay. So, and Jay Warner Wallace brings this out in his book, uh, Cold Case Christianity. So you have Paul writing in 55 AD, quoting Which Luke. no one disputes, right? No he, one was, dis he was writing before, way before yeah. 70. Yeah, yes, way before 70. Yeah. Um, in 55 or 56. That's, right. We know when Paul was in Corinth and when mm -hmm. he wrote all that and wrote the letter to the Corinthians. And no one doubts that Paul existed. No, nobody doubts Paul existed. And nobody no doubts sane, he wrote 1 no Corinthians. No sane person, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No sane person. He, he wrote 1 Corinthians. And Paul is quoting Luke, which would have to mean he's prior to that. That Luke is prior to that. And almost everybody thinks Mark is first. And Luke got yeah. from Mark. So you're, now you got Mark earlier. Also, if you notice that, and this is certainly a circumstantial point, but it's an interesting point. The only one of the four Gospels that doesn't mention the name of the high priest is Mark. Now, why not? It could be that maybe Mark was writing prior to Caiaphas leaving the high priesthood, which would have been prior to 37 AD. Could be that early, or at least the source he's quoting is that early. Hmm. That kind of sounds like a, an argument from silence. Well, it could be. Yeah. It could be, but why does everybody else name him and Mark doesn't? Maybe because Mark's writers would think, hey, I'm just talking about the guy who's, in, who's the high priest right now. Mm -hmm. That's possible. Yeah. The stronger argument is this, though. If you look at the book of Acts, the book of Acts, I think, is undeniably written prior to 62 AD. Because how does it What's end? your reason for that? Well, there's a number of reasons. Uh, uh, Paul, uh, not Paul, uh, Colin Hemmer, the Roman historian, wrote a book back in 1989 called The Setting of Acts in Hellenistic History. Colin We're, Hemmer? Colin Hemmer, H-E-M-E-R. It's a big green book about that big. And he goes through Acts with a fine tooth comb and he gives 13 reasons why Paul or why Luke wrote Acts at least prior to 62 AD. Some of them have to do with the idea that, well, he doesn't mention anything about the temple being destroyed. You say it's an argument from silence. No, it's not because not just Acts, but other writings are written as if the temple is still standing. Even John is written as if the temple is still standing. In John mm -hmm. chapter five, he talks about the Pool of Bethesda is still standing. Pool of Bethesda was destroyed in 70 AD. Yeah. He's talking about being there. Um, but also, mm. um, you got the two main characters in the book of Acts are Peter and Paul. No mention of them being executed by Nero. Yet he does mention other, other executions. Yeah, when was Stephen? Paul, when was Paul executed? Sometime in the, in the 60s? 60s. Sometime in the mid-60s. And we have pretty good evidence from this, yeah. certainly from Clement of Rome, who wrote in about 95 AD. So there's no, there's no talk about Paul being killed. There's no talk about the Jewish uprising, which began in 66 AD. None of this is mentioned. It's like talking about the history of New York City, and there's no mention of 9-11. There's no mention of the tr trade towers being mm -hmm. destroyed. Mention of them being built, but no mention of them being destroyed. I think it's important to make a distinction. So like... Arguments from silence can sometimes be, and historians talk about this, they can mm -hmm. sometimes be a somewhat good reason mm -hmm, to think mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. something happened. It yes. depends on whether or not you'd really, really expect them mm -hmm. to say this or not. Well, and it's so not, that's, that's it, what it sort of comes yes, down to. And, and what you're arguing here is that 
for the in the case of like the destruction of the temple, mm -hmm. which was like one of the biggest events in Jewish history, sure. like that's something you probably. But it's not just an argument from silence, Cameron. Mm -hmm. It's also the fact that other documents are written as if the temple is still in existence yeah. when they're written. And the pool so, is still there. Yeah, so you've got all this corroboration. And Hemmer, as I say, has 13 points. We have them in the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. All these reasons to believe Acts is written by 62. Why would you mention Stephen and James have been killed, but not the two main characters, Peter and Paul? And why does the book of Acts end abruptly in Rome where Paul's under house arrest? There's no mention of him being executed, none of that. Why? Because that's when Probably he stopped, when writing. When it stopped writing. He may have even died at that point yeah. after that, Luke. So you've got early documents, early documents here. In my view, they're all of them, maybe Revelation's written late, but even Revelation is pre presupposes the temple still stands. So that may be written early too. So here's, here's just a, a random question that has mm -hmm. nothing to do with what was on the, the, the list here. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of seems like, okay, so a lot of the things that you're arguing are very convenient for a Christian worldview. Mm -hmm. How would you respond to someone who says, that you're just coming to these positions because you sort of just want to believe that all these things are true and that's why you're finding reasons to, to lead to this well, preconceived conclusion that you already believed beforehand and that's why you're taking these views. Well, look, I didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't grow up a Christian. I mean, I grew up always believing in God, but I never knew who Jesus was. I mean, I was brought up in the Catholic home. I went to Catholic high school, but I never knew who Jesus was. I, didn't, I never knew, I never got it. I was, I know I always, there's got to be a cause out there, you know, but yeah. I just didn't know who Jesus was. And I actually had so many questions. A friend of mine finally said, you just need to read some books, right? Here's, here's evidence to man's a verdict, more than a carpenter, those old Josh McDowell books. I just read them and said, you know, these are true. This makes sense. And so I wasn't necessarily predisposed to believe it. I just wanted to know if it was true. And look, we all have motivations, yeah. right? And sometimes it's difficult to separate motivation from fact. You could have confirmation bias, these kind of things. It was Pascal who famously said, people almost invariably base their beliefs not on the basis of proof, but on the basis of what they find attractive, right? But look, a lot of times I don't find Christianity attractive, right? It, it's difficult. It's inconvenient to be a Christian sometimes, right? You got to do what's right. You can't just do whatever you want. You're supposed to sacrifice your will at times to do the Lord's will, right? right? So it can be difficult. So at least for me, in fact, my friend Jay Warner Wallace puts it this way. He goes, I'm not a Christian because it works for me. He said, it doesn't work for me. <laughs> it's, it's hard. It's difficult. Yeah. I had a better life when it wasn't true, when I thought it wasn't true. So yeah, sure. It could be that sometimes you're just looking for evidence. I think atheists can do the same thing. Yeah. The question yeah, exactly. is, it's a my, double -edged sword. yeah, the question isn't, our psychology, the question is the evidence and how do you interpret the evidence? What, where does the evidence point? Yeah. And, and, and that's gonna be a judgment that everyone has to make. I think what happens oftentimes is that people turn to psychology when they're done. Like mm -hmm. you're, you're at the end of your rope on mm -hmm. being able to refute the evidence. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is then you turn to psychology and sure. try to explain away someone's belief. And that's, you know, psychology is not epistemology. It's not metaphysics. It's not evidence, you, it's, it's a completely separate thing where you're trying to explain someone's belief and sort of make yourself feel better yeah, your about psychology your own positions. Will, will not tell you whether or not Christianity is true. Yeah. The evidence is what you need to look at to discover whether it's true or not. Yeah. And look, I always ask people this question. In fact, I just asked it to our group here. I said, I want you to think of somebody who's not a Christian whom you'd like to be a Christian. Everyone gets somebody in their head and I say, okay, I wanna ask you this question about the person you're thinking of. Is the person you're thinking of on a relentless pursuit of truth. In other words, they wanna know if Christianity is true or are they apathetic or maybe even hostile? And 99 times out of 10, as my friend Richard Howe says, when I ask the question, is the person on a relentless pursuit of truth? Nobody raises their hand, nobody. No, not, they're not interested. And then I ask them, are they apathetic or hostile? Everyone's hand goes up. Why? Most people aren't looking for, they're not on a truth quest, they're on a happiness quest. And they're just going to believe whatever they think is going to make them happy. Here's the problem. You can make yourself happy over the short term, doing a lot of fun, but ultimately destructive things. Over the long term, it's a disaster, though. The only way to get true contentment is to go straight through truth, and Jesus is the truth. Let me ask you one last question, mm -hmm. and then we'll close it out. Mm -hmm. So how do you spend your devotional time? How, how mm -hmm. often do you spend time in prayer and in reading mm -hmm. the Bible and mm -hmm. that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, more. I should do it more than I do, but right now I'm going through the Psalms. I'm trying to read five Psalms a day and just contemplating on the psalm. For me, the psalms are, cathar are cathartic. Mm -hmm. You read the psalms and you realize the range of emotions in the psalms. Yeah. Anywhere from, man, God, where are you? To God, you're wonderful. You know, all mm -hmm. that is in there. God can handle any, any of our emotions. 
So I enjoyed the Psalms. And, uh, and then I think I'm going to start going through the Gospels again. Hmm. You know, I just try and sit down every morning and read some. Sometimes I don't get to it. I'll be honest with you, sometimes I don't. If I'm on the run, sometimes I don't. And in that case, a lot of times I'll put it up, take my Bible app, and I'll listen to it on the way in the car. Sometimes when I'm working, like I'm cutting my lawn, I'll just put it on. I'll put the, uh, the one Bible on my uh, headphones or I'll listen to a podcast or something. Prayer, in fact, I just started reading Timothy Keller's book on prayer. Because, Such a good book. Because while I'm, I, I pray, I pray a lot during the day, but I, having these long periods of prayer, hardly ever. And I should. You know, I'm so task oriented. I got so many things to do. It was like, it was C.S. Lewis who said something like this. He said, you have to resist the, uh, well, let me put it another way. He said something like, every day you wake up, it's like there's a bunch of charging elephants coming at you. And you're tempted to just try and deal with them when you really ought to just stop and read and pray. Because, you know, I got so much to do today. I got yeah. all this X, Y, and Z. And, so I need to be better at that. So I just started reading Keller's book on prayer because I wanted to see what he had to say about it. Because I, I, like I, I think you'll find so it really much. helpful. Yeah, I'm only a few chapters in. Yeah, it's great. All right. Well, thanks for coming on to Capturing Christianity. It's been Actually, awesome. You, well, you captured me for at least 45 minutes. <laughs> good, man. Okay, good. Awesome. Well, so thanks, thanks, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, guys, for watching. Yeah. And and and, and support. Yeah. On Pat Patron, right? Is that pa it? Patreon. 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 Yeah. Patreon.com slash capturing Christianity. Patreon.com slash capturing Christianity. Yep. Okay, good. Thanks, Cameron. Thanks yep. for the work you're doing. Awesome. All right. Sign up. Do it now. <laughs>